What's up, tweeners? Welcome back to another Tweener Tennis video today here on the channel. Today we have another, another pro interview with Patrick Kipson. You saw him on one of our earlier videos where we did the bounce game where he played with Novak Djokovic and absolutely proved it by kicking my butt. We wanted to get him on the channel to talk about his experience winning Kalamazoo as a junior player, making an unbelievable run at Wimbledon Junior. We love talking to Patrick because of his insight into what it takes and the mindset that you need to become a professional tennis player as well as coming from playing at Texas A&M for one semester and knowing that he wanted to be pro immediately. From being a player at Texas A&M and then transitioning into the pros, he gave us some great insight in why he only did one semester and why he decided to go pro so early in his college tennis career. Now, I hope you guys do enjoy this video. Make sure you do leave a like and comment on this video. Our road to 4K is starting now after we just hit three. So I would love to have you guys join the Tweener Tennis family. So make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's totally free. And now enjoy our interview with Patrick Hipson. Thanks for doing this, man. I really yeah, appreciate it. I appreciate it. No, it's um, if anyone is watching this or listening to this and wondering why I'm out of breath, you'll see why in the next video <laughs> uh, because we're doing it right after we played a little bit of the Djokovic drill. And yeah. And yeah, I got loose with that. <laughs> Ran loose. my man around a little bit. That's OK. That's <laughs> OK. And Patrick, why don't we start from the beginning? How'd you get into tennis? Yeah, so I'm from Greenville, North mm -hmm. Carolina, um, more towards the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, just grew up, uh, you know, best friend of mine was, was playing tennis, and I joined in with him when I was around seven. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a nice tennis club in Greenville, actually, with some clay courts. Tommy Paul is actually from oh, that's right. Greenville, North Carolina as well. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, that's how it started. I used to play ice hockey as well, so played both. And then um, around, I think, 10, 11, started focusing just on tennis, and mm -hmm. that's been it. And what made you stick to tennis over hockey? Um, you know, I'm not quite sure. Looking back, <laughs> looking back, <laughs> I love hockey still. So, okay. um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I wish I would have stick, stuck with hockey. But <laughs> why do you think you should have stuck with it? No, I mean, I missed like the team aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I like kind of being on a team. Mm -hmm. um, I probably like it more so now. And after I played a season of college tennis than I did mm -hmm. when I was like maybe 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. um, no, but I'm, I'm happy I chose tennis in the end. And I think it suits me well. I'm kind of like more of a quiet guy, and mm -hmm. um, I love to compete. So whatever it is, I'm, I'm always down to compete. So. And you played, and kind of going into the team aspect, you did play a semester of yep. college tennis. 2018, spring season. A&M? Texas A&M. Yep. And we talked about this before we started playing, too. You... You kind of knew that you were going for a semester, right? Yeah. Walk us through that process, because I feel like a lot of kids that do commit to play college tennis either stick out for a whole season or they try to at least see it through a little bit more. But yeah. what was what was behind that decision? Yeah. So, I, like I said, you know, before we started shooting, but um, I had a really good last year of my junior career. Mm -hmm. So that year I was 17 turning 18. Mm -hmm. I won Kalamazoo that year, um, made semifinals of the Junior Wimbledon, won my first Futures title. Um, so I was kind of 50-50 on like going to school or just turning pro right away. And then kind of last minute I decided to go to A&M. I really thought the coach could help me develop more, Steve mm -hmm. Denton. Um, but that was always the plan, just to go one semester. I felt like I was still young enough to where I could go and play six months and then have you know i would i was 18 and a half when i finished so <laughs> it's not like i had missed a bunch of time you know mm -hmm. i wanted to start competing on the tour like as soon as possible so i felt like i kind of got the best of both worlds going to school kind of getting feeling like i have a little bit of a backup plan if things don't go well mm -hmm. and, and then i got to go out and and you know play on the tour when i was 18 so um Kind of best of both worlds, I think. And it's funny because for someone to kind of admit that, like, you go to school half a semester, especially at a great SEC school, and this is not a knock on A&M, but when you kind of commit yourself to go and then 
see the results too, why wouldn't you just go pro? Do you kind of look back at that decision, think twice about it? About leaving? About going. Or about going, about about going, going to school in the first place? To be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, it could have gone both ways, like I said. I mean, I don't know. I probably wasn't ready. And it's not like I was a lot better physically when I did a semester of college. But, okay. I mean, I was, you know, like I said, barely 18 when I went. So, like, wasn't the strongest kid physically. Mm-hmm. Probably wasn't the most mature either, honestly. So, I felt like I could get a little stronger, a little bit more mature, maybe going to school. And, like, I mean, I'm playing, you know, pretty much a really high level in yeah. the SEC at that time. I mean, still is, I think. Yeah. I don't follow college tennis that 100%. much. but. I mean, I'm playing guys every other match that are, you know, top 200 players now, top 100 players. So yeah. I felt like I got that. I got a lot of matches in. I got stronger. I got probably more mentally tough, mm-hmm. you know, playing in college. And then I secured, like, an education further down the road, which at the time for me wasn't so important. But yeah. for my parents, yeah, um, that it was is. something they wanted me to explore a little bit. So. And going into that kind of maturity level too, you played, like you said, you had a lot of success in your junior career, going to play a junior Grand Slam, going to play Kalamazoo. When you travel that much at 18, yeah. was it, was it, I, I think I've struggled to find the words because of, it's not a normal life when you have that much success as a junior so how would you kind of describe basically being a pro without having the repercussions of losing money every day, but just being there and competing? Yeah. What was that like to kind of go through? To kind of like the transition, you mean, from yeah. juniors to, to pros? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely, I've definitely felt the pressure more in the beginning. Okay starting off my professional career and like i told you i've been hurt for a lot of the you know Mm -hmm. a lot of the time since i left so i haven't really i haven't played as much as i would have liked to Mm -hmm. um but definitely you feel you know in juniors like everything's good you're showing up to kalamazoo you're showing up to the open you're showing up to wimbledon you know everyone in the tournament you know all the guys playing like everyone's kind of it's a more kind of friendly environment i'd Mm -hmm. say and then uh, you step out onto the tour and you start in the futures, you start in the challengers and you know, there's no free anything there. There's no free yeah. points. There's no, everyone's just dogging everyone. Cause yeah. you know, you start at the bottom and you try and work up. Everyone's got the same, you know, goal kind yeah. of. So it's, it's highly competitive. I mean, the beginning stages of pro tennis are yeah. about as competitive as anything that I can think of. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you can go watch a future in Croatia and, you know, see the level of compete and the level of fight in these guys and good tennis players. Yeah. You know, but there's such a few number you're going to see on TV. Yeah. It's the reality of, you know, tennis and, and our sport. So it's it when that happens too. And you mentioned it before we, filmed everything it's when you at the time of this video that we're recording breakpoint the f1 drive to survive series of tennis just came out and you mentioned they should do one about the challenger tour guys and yeah what was what was the wake-up call or what was that first moment like feeling that intensity on the like now fully committed into the pro tour yeah um I don't know if there was like a specific moment or if it was kind of just gradually introduced <laughs> every week, every just tournament that I played. Slowly. Yeah. But the more you travel and like, especially going overseas and playing, mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably where you get, you know, your first real dose of it. You mm-hmm. know, when you're 18, 19 and you go and you play futures challengers overseas, that's probably where you start to see kind of how big of a grind it is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, tough to get to places and, you know, the whole logistics thing is a challenge, you know. And you were doing this by yourself? Yeah, I mean, I had a coach travel with me at some some weeks. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm figuring out how to get, go from point A to point B. By yourself? Yeah. 
<laughs> so it's basically your travel agent and the player <laughs> and the manager all at the same time. Yeah. Do you feel that stress? I used to feel it a lot more because it was, you know, it was you know. newer to me. But by now, I've gotten used to it, and I'm trying. You know, I think every player who kind of manages themselves try and not let it affect you because okay. it can, it can definitely affect you. Yeah. Oh, hundred <laughs> you percent. If you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you've lost one too many weeks in a row, it can be, you know, more frustrating than it probably should be. It w so for you, oh. Go ahead. No, that's it. That's it. Um, is that the harsh reality that people are missing from tennis, or at least the perception of it? I would say so. I mean, obviously, look at the top. I mean, it's life's different. life's a little bit different. Yeah. I mean, the the grind and the compete is still, you know, it's the same. It's yeah. high. Obviously, you know, those guys are the best in the world. Mm -hmm. They're competing for something that. You know they want as just as the lower level players are trying to get up those guys are trying to you know evolve and whatnot so level of compete is the same but you know it's nicer venues you know you're making more money so yeah. you're actually able to you know like create a life if you, yeah. if you will you know it's like have a life outside of the yeah sport. for me everything i make i put i put right back in you yeah because i'm not making enough to put away like buy a house or something you know? <laughs> yes so. What do you think the biggest difference is? You see all this success with players and those that are in the 250 area, almost in that qualifying spot for majors, which is a huge difference for people playing on the tour level versus the challenger level. Yep. What do you think, and I'm going to put you on the spot here because you're, you're one of them, what's the, what's the difference really between the top 50 and the 150 to 250? I'd say it's... If I could say one thing, yeah. it would just be consistency. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily mean like consistency of like the guy who's 50 makes 18 balls in a row and the guy who's 250 makes nine balls in a row. Yeah. But just like it's a mental consistency. At least that's what I feel because mm -hmm. when I practice with the top guys, I just feel like that's the thing that makes them kind of special. Yeah that like mental consistency, there's always a structure to what they're doing when they're playing. Mm -hmm. You know, very, very seldomly are they out there just kind of like just playing or hitting balls. You yeah. know, they're like, they know what they're trying to do. They're engaged, mentally engaged yeah. all the time. Um, yeah, I'd say that's the biggest difference because I mean, there's guys 400 that hit the ball better than some guys in the top 200, yeah. you know? Everyone hits the ball well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, some guys are more fit than others. Some guys have bigger serves than others. You yeah. Know, everyone's unique, but I would say consistency is the, for me, something that I would try and work on to get to that level. Do you always, do you go into every match having that same mentality, or what's it? What's the process like for you, kind of going into game day? Yeah. So I mean, for me, I kind of. I look at what I want to do first. You know, okay. I want to play the way that I'm training to play. I want to play the way that my coach and I are trying to help my game evolve. Mm -hmm. And then within that, there's certain things, you know, specifics on the guy that I'm playing. Hey, if we need to direct more traffic to the forehand, to the backhand, watch watch the guy's second serve tee on the ad side, you know, things like that. But yeah. for the most part, I'd like to kind of go into it more based on myself. Okay. And I just feel like, if I do the things that I want to do and I do them well, that I'll have chances to, you know, be competitive at least. What's, it's hard to say because I was talking to Kyle, a uh, head coach here at NC State about being 100%, 100% of the time. How do you find a way to win or what keeps you playing at the consistent way what, what's your recipe for having that consistency um i would just say you got to remember at least for me i mean there's a lot of days where i mean you're not feeling great out there mm. or when you know things are not looking so good but you just have i mean for me what i'd like to do is just try and remember the goal that i've set you know mm -hmm. over the years and what i'm trying to do with my career and yeah. Um, you just have to find a way to, you know, push through it. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that the more you play on the tour and 
honestly, the more tough losses you take and the more and the more days you can show up and not feel great and win, yeah. those are those are things that make you, I think, evolve and, mm -hmm. and better, you know, and you start to see that and, you know, be aware of it and I think that, you know, that's a big help. Yeah, I, I love that answer because it kind of gives you the perspective on what's happening, not just for you, but for other players as well and what they put into the game and kind of going into other players too. You've had the opportunity to play with a lot of great people yep. and obviously you've played with Novak Djokovic and it really shows when we played. <laughs> um, what? Who's a player that you've played with that surprised you when you pl hit with them? Surprised me in terms of like... <laughs> their ability, whether it was mental, physical, their strokes. What's a player that kind of jumped off the page? I mean... I would, I would have to say probably Novak. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, I've practiced a decent amount with Andy Murray as well. Okay. And, I mean, listen, those guys are generational talents, so they yeah. have things that really no one can do and no yeah. one else will probably ever be able to do, which is, you know, why they're generational talents. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I've trained, when I trained with Novak, um, yeah, I mean, like you said, his mental state is by far the best i think in, in men's tennis and really? best it'll ever be i think he's the best version of mental whatever you want to call it strength that'll ever happen on the really? on the tour yeah I more than that, rafa yeah, i would i would give him like a slight a slight edge okay um but the ability of those guys just the way they absorb power the way they move i mean novak's movement is Incredible, one of the best ever, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just special, special guys, really. Lots, lots of talent too, which helps. <laughs> yeah, it really does. And I've never trained with Rafa, so I can't, I can't speak about that. But I mean, his intensity, it's you know, pretty intense. It's pretty special what yeah. he does, what he brings to the table on a. Listen, he shows up to warm up, and he's, he's, you know, guns blazing, he's full mm. speed, and it's crazy. That doesn't work for everyone, but that's what he needs to get in his zone and feel yeah. like he's ready to play. So to be able to do that for two decades is, yeah. it's mentally exhausting. <laughs> um, it's physically exhausting. So it's the way, the way he can do that is, uh, you know, it's really special, I think. So is Novak on the top of your t uh, big three list? That's tough, man. I don't. If you were to rank the, well, we'll go big four because you been with Murray. Yeah. Um, if you were to put the top big four in that category, who's your like go second, third, fourth? In terms of who I think is the best or yeah, who I your like personal, the most? Your personal opinion. On who I think is the best. Yeah. <sighs> I do think Novak will end up with the most slams. Okay. And if we go. But he's not your goat. It's tough, man. It's, it's tough. <laughs> I I love Rafa personally. Okay. So I'd put him at my number one. I'd put Novak at my number two. Roger at number three, and I put Andy at four. Okay. That that seems like a fair assessment. You could probably go any way. Yeah. With those top three. Yeah. I think every, I mean Andy has won the least because of those three guys. Yeah. But the amount of runner-up titles he has just from the three it's of them insane. Is, is incredible. It's, it's insane. Like, it's like Roddick with Wimbledon. People don't realize how consistent Andy's been, though. Yeah. Because you look at his title numbers, and they're significantly lower than those guys, and that's because he loses in the semis or the finals to one of them. Yeah. But he's, in, he's incredibly consistent for 15 years, you know. Especially with a guy with a metal hip. Amazing. It's, Amazing what that guy can do. And his work ethic, you know, like I said, I've spent some time around him. His work ethic and his, like, attitude is... He's so professional. He's really? Like, yeah, so professional. And, um, that, I mean, it's helped me being around him, learning how to carry myself like that. And, wow. Um, yeah, I, I really like, you know, Andy, and I respect him a lot. So. so what's one piece of advice or what's a piece of knowledge that you kind of gained so far, yet you're only 23? What's one piece of knowledge or experience that you've kind of absorbed on tour or in college or hitting with some of these guys that you would give to someone that's in high school or who's trying to kind of go along the same path, what would you say to them? Yeah, I would say, I mean, for me, I try and look at it like I always get, I always have to do 
always got to cross the T's, dot the I's type of thing. So okay. you got to do, you got to be intentional about your training. Okay. Um, you got to show up with a purpose every day mm -hmm. and uh, you got to make sure things off the court are taken care of, your, your training, your nutrition, yeah. your sleep. I mean, those guys are, those guys have that stuff dialed down to a T, yeah. you know? So um, for younger people, players i think it's important to look at the look at those guys and have those guys be your role models and copy what they do copy how they you know they're intentional about all that stuff i think that's something you see when you're a junior and you're playing grand slams and you're in the locker room or you're on the practice courts and you're seeing how guys are training you're seeing how guys are what they're doing after practice how they're going into the gym they're they're stretching whatever it is you know yeah um but having that kind of uh routine to your day as a tennis player i think is really important because you got to fill your day with productive things you know yeah practice is only two hours or four hours and then how do you be productive the rest of the day and how do you organize yourself and exactly in that regard because i yeah. feel like that's that's where i think a lot of people don't understand that that's not what people see it's everything else that's kind of led up to that moment yeah right exactly i mean the amount of yeah the amount of stuff that those guys i do off the court is you know significantly more i'd say than what i do on the court you know there's time training there's time on the table doing rehab there's time talking to a sports psychologist mm -hmm. there's time watching film yeah you know like it's not like we just go home and yeah at least most of us don't. You know, <laughs> That's fair. Go home and, you know, yeah. hop on Netflix or whatever. And there's a time for that, you know, when you're traveling and you're beat down and yeah. it's time to relax, it's time to relax. But, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis when you're training or you're in between events, fill your day with productive, you know, productive things. I kind of have a one last question. It's like an A and B question. One, how, one A, I should say, how a lot of people don't necessarily talk about how much they watch their film. They kind of rely on their coaches to tell them what they've done, but with tennis analytics and everything going through that, how much film do you watch in the day and how important is that to you? And then after you answer that one, I'll get to the next question. Yeah, I've gone through different like spurts of how much I, how much I watch. Okay. Um, at times I've watched couple hours a day to all the way up to nothing really, really? just depending on kind of how I'm feeling or okay. how well I know the guy that I'm playing I'll you know usually like to watch a little bit of every guy that I play if I can yeah sometimes there's guys I'm playing that don't have any film so yeah. um you know I watch probably yeah right now 15 20 minutes of film you can watch highlights these days yeah. so like you don't have to skip through the match and yeah um, yeah, watch a match or two, different conditions of, of highlights, and that's pretty much it. Like I said, I try and focus more on like what I want to do and make kind of micro adjustments based on who I'm playing. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if there's like a popcorn match right now, you know, in yeah. Aussie, I'll watch. I'll watch the whole thing. Oh yeah, I like watching tennis. So, okay. Um, well, that's good to hear. Some people that play yeah, pro some people hate don't, it. They don't they never like it watch at all. Um, because they get enough of it yeah i get that day. too i mean i understand that but i like it so yeah i'm not against it and if there's a good match and definitely definitely tune in and watch and for you my last question is kind of going back to what you were saying before about crossing the t's dotting the i's how long or how long of your work how long is your work day and i put that in quotes because like you said your work day people say it's on court but in reality there's another four hours that you don't do on the court so yep. how long is your quote-unquote work day as a pro tennis player all day <laughs> I, for me all day that's so, you know like i i feel like i'm on an extreme end of the spectrum in terms of like how much i do or how much time i'm gonna put into it yeah just because like i said i don't really that's what i enjoy doing yeah so like I consider stringing rackets part of my work day. Okay. Because I need my rackets to, to play. Yeah. It's part of my work. Yeah. I consider stretching while I'm after, after dinner when I'm watching TV part of my work day. I ha it's something I need to do to get ready for the next day. Yeah. Other than obviously the, the stuff that is clearly work, which yeah. is getting in the gym, 
getting on the table for rehab, yeah. doing rehab exercises, getting in the ice bath, yeah. getting in the sauna, um, you know, calculating the food I need to eat, logging my food, tracking my sleep. I mean, that's all workday stuff, I guess. That it, I just got overwhelmed just thinking <laughs> about how much shit you do. I, like I said, I'm on I'm on an extreme end of the spectrum. I'm yeah. I'm like a big numbers guy, big okay. data guy. So I okay. all the training I do, I have it like documented. Okay. Um, yeah, I just feel like the seeing the numbers on like a spreadsheet or piece of paper helps helps know what I've done throughout yep. the day, throughout the week, and then you can look back six months ago and you know see what you were doing. Yeah. You can fix things, you know, physical problems that are coming up. You can make adjustments because you know how much you were you know working six months ago, yeah. how much you were on the court, what you were doing, and whatnot. So that's kind of the approach I take to it. Um, I know a lot of guys are on the complete opposite end of that spectrum that Don't. just go out there, they play, they do what they need to do in the gym. Yeah, They're still doing their work, but it's not so, you know, regimented or rigid like, like gotcha. mine is. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. I really no, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Yes, sir.